Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, two powerful Republican women, Finance Chair Julie Rosen and Health and Human Services Chair Michelle Benson, reflect on their Senate careers as they prepare to leave the legislature and a remembrance of Senator David Thomasoni. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. More than 500 years of experience is about to retire from the Minnesota legislature at the end of this year, taking with them a significant amount of institutional knowledge and negotiating prowess. Among the soon-to-be retirees is one who has played a pivotal role in combating drug abuse, reforming pensions, and keeping the Vikings here in Minnesota. Senator Julie Rosen. Thank, thank you, you for Shannon. Joining me. Thank you very much. So let's start with uh, football season because it's just around the corner. You were chief author of the bill that got the U.S. Bank Stadium built. What's your perspective on this accomplishment? Well, it was a no-brainer at the time, and it actually it was the House uh, Representative Maury Lanning and Governor Dayton. And the three of us did not move without the other two being okay with what we did. It was uh, an amazing piece of legislation, a lot of work because there was some people that didn't believe the Vikings would be looking at another territory, which they, as, as history shows, uh, LA was open and they could have moved and they were looking at moving. So they are the fabric of Minnesota, one of the fabrics of Minnesota. And we put together a very good deal that was great for Minneapolis, for the city and for the Vikings. And now we have a state of the art, incredible stadium that's very beneficial to all of us, especially the state. And uh, we should be very proud of that piece of uh, property. Yeah. Uh, you also led the charge to get some major reforms in the pension system implemented back in 2018. The state was paying out more than it was taking in, and with the aging baby boomers, um, the tsunami, the silver tsunami coming, it was only going to get worse. And you have cited pension reform as one of your top accomplishments. Why was this so important to you? Well, don't tell anybody, but I l really love pensions. <laughs> That's kind of a wonky thing, but so critical to the state to have a solid, uh, viable, healthy pension plan going forward. And we need to protect our state workers. They work very hard, whether it's um, you know, our teachers, our firefighters, our police officers, our state workers. Everybody works very hard, so we had to stabilize those funds. And that was a joint effort. It was shared sacrifice, all those great terms, but that bill was extremely important. It couldn't have come at a better time. We were kind of on our last leg there. And uh, we, we showed the rest of this, the, the nation that it can be done, pension reform, with, with uh, everybody coming to the table and working on it, and we did. Early in your Senate career, you led the Minnesota Methamphetamine Task Force, which resulted in passage of major anti-meth legislation in 2005. Considering the breadth of the legislation that you have shepherded over these 20 years now in the Senate, was it that early experience in tackling meth that gave you the tools and the understanding that you needed to become such a successful lawmaker? Oh, well, thank you. Um, absolutely, meth had landed in my, my district, Southern Minnesota. They had made a significant child endangerment law change in Iowa, so all the meth cooks were coming into Southern Minnesota. I had not a clue how to handle it, but got together about 35 people twice a month over nine months to develop the largest methamphetamine bill in the nation, and we passed it all at once. And that's what's significant, because most states peel off one issue at a time. It had not only put the pseudofedrin behind the counter to stop the meth cooks, it worked on child endangerment, it worked on remediation of contaminated property, it worked on uh, disclosure of contaminated property, it worked on uh, treatment and making some safe harbor homes, some for meth homes for mothers with, with children, addicted uh, mothers. It was an incredible piece of legislation. Could not have passed that without the help of all of the players, the retailers, the judges, police officers, the you know, nonpartisan staff, our staff. It just went on and on, but also um, my colleagues from across the aisle. And Senator Berglund calls me up one Saturday morning and we're chit-chatting and she says, well, how's the meth bill coming? And I said, good. And she goes, well, I'd like to help you with it. And I said, you're not going to take that bill from me, are you? 
<laughs> and she goes, no, you need help passing this. You can't get this passed without my help. And I realized at that time, you need to ask and you need to reach across the aisle, whether you're in the majority or the minority. That was a significant lesson right there. On another drug front, you were instrumental in the establishment in 2019 of licensing fees on opioid distributors and manufacturers to begin raising additional funding to tackle the societal ramifications of opioid, of opioid abuse. And those funds um, have been and are still being used mm -hmm. to fund treatment and county services. Is Minnesota now on the right track in tackling opioid abuse? We are on a very, very solid path going forward, and we've uh, laid a very good foundation with that bill. Um, I have the, a very soft spot in my heart for children that are in abusive situations because of drug addiction, and I think that's because of the methamphetamine bill. So took the opioid um, issues head on with a lot of colleagues on both sides of the aisle to, to address that. And we did an outstanding bill uh, with the help of um, you know, you know, the executive branch. I mean, it was it, an incredible piece of legislation. Have uh, great faith that we are tackling that issue and we have the resources that are available and more resources coming. And we have um, a system to make sure that we can get the relief out. Now, in a couple answers here, you've spoken of working across the aisle and group efforts to get big legislation done. Is that potentially a message to future people who will be coming to the legislature? Absolutely. Do not feel too comfortable in your seat, whether you're in the minority or majority. And you cannot get anything substantial done here at this Capitol without knowing your colleagues and working across the aisle. And if I can give one piece of advice, go to people's offices and sit down and talk to them in, at, in their environment, in their situation. When you have a bill and you need signatures, go personally to them and ask for them to sign on to the bill. Makes you explain the bill, why you're passionate about this, why you're doing it, and you develop a relationship. It's been very difficult the last couple of years with our, uh, the COVID pandemic and this lack of communication and looking at each other in the eyes. But those personal one-on-one -on -one skills are so critical to getting anything done here. And relatedly, in a 2012 article in the Mankato Free Press, author Mark Fishnick pointed out that you are, quote, virtually never in the middle of the partisan warfare that draws TV time and other media coverage. Has that been intentional on your part? And would the state benefit from more lawmakers focusing on the work and not on the politics? I think that he's probably giving me more credit than is due. But yeah, I think it was intentional that it's, I don't, I don't want to waste my time with the partisan par politics. Um, the majority of my term has been raising children and I left children at home uh, for six months out of the year. So I had to t stay very focused on what my priorities were for the district here at the Capitol and what was best for the entire state. I, and I wish more, um, more legislators understood that. We've had this uh, wave of, of um, people that have come in and really have taken it to extremes on either side. So, you know, you have to, you have to work with people and um, you have to compromise. And that's been my goal. I'm not gonna waste my time, uh, my family's time, uh, by being a partisan. Have you accomplished what you set out to do in 2002 when you first came here? Absolutely, absolutely, Shannon. Uh, I can walk away and say, oh, we did good. Um, and I can tell my family that you, your sacrifice was worth it because a lot of good legislation happened uh, on my watch and the watch of other people too, but thank you very much. And I can go back to my constituents and say, you believed in me and I appreciate that so very much. They are the best people in the world and uh, hopefully I, I served you well. In fact, I know I served you well. Senator Julie Rosen, I wanna thank you for your service and I wanna thank you for your time today. Thank you, thank you very much, Shannon. It's been great working with you. Senator David Thomasoni, who served 30 years in the Minnesota legislature, passed away recently from ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. While battling the complications of the disease, he championed a bill to increase funding for ALS research, 
which culminated in a ceremonial bill signing for the new law last March in the governor's reception room. You know, the governor called me shortly after my diagnosis told me that he would support whatever I wanted. I received similar assurances from Speaker Hortman and Majority Leader Miller. Maybe I should have asked for more. <laughs> such assurances I never would have expected to be here. Signing this particular bill, participating in a signing ceremony of this magnitude, surrounded by so much love and friendship. I will never forget the day last June, when David came into our suite up on the third floor here, and he had been doctoring on Fridays, and he came in on Monday morning, and I immediately went into his office, and I said, David, what did you find out at the doctor Friday? And he had a hard time getting the words, and he said, I've got ALS. And I said, well, David, what's, what's the prognosis? And he said, Tom, they told me there's nothing they can do. Senator Tomasoni served briefly as the Senate president, and he was best known for his work on behalf of Minnesota's Iron Range. Senator Tom Bach, who formed an independent caucus in the Senate with Tomasoni, said, we lost a giant. Senate Majority Leader Jeremy Miller said that, David was a wonderful colleague, friend, and mentor, not only to me, but to so many at the state capitol. And Senate Minority Leader Melissa Lopez Franzen said, he was successful because he built bridges and worked collaboratively and with dignity, love and respect, even during the most contentious debates. Upon her election to the Senate in 2010, Senator Michelle Benson of Ham Lake has been a leader in the Republican caucus and a champion for transparency in government. As she prepares to retire from the Senate, she joined me this week to reflect on her dozen years of service. I think it's fair to say that Health and Human Services has been a priority for you as a lawmaker. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've always served on that committee and you chaired that committee from 2017 through 2021. Health and Human Services spending comprises a major portion of the state's budget. What drew you to focus in this area? Um, well. Health and Human Services is the fastest growing part of our budget, impacts the lives of more Minnesotans than any other single area. And it's where the toughest decisions had to be made. And so um, had aging parents. I had a nephew who had a severe disability. I had audited hospitals. I had friends who ran nursing homes. And so I thought my breadth of experience and exposure was a good fit. And I'm also not afraid of a challenge and health and human services was definitely a challenge, whether you're a member of the committee or um, as chair or lead. What challenges do you see ahead specifically for this budget area in the state? Um, the rapidly increasing demand for care in this area, the tabled our demographic elderly, um, frankly, the rising cost. Uh, innovation in this space is amazing, but it's also expensive. And so being able to have public taking responsibility for their health while maintaining a safety net, um, the ability to say no is very hard in this area because everybody needs something. You stepped down from this very powerful position as Health and Human Services Chair earlier this year to become Minnesota's lone female candidate for governor, saying that you wanted to bring a mom's common sense to the role of the state's chief executive. What did you learn from this experience? Um, well, first of all, there's very little I'm afraid of anymore. You ask people for what you need, you perform to the best of your ability and stand by your principles be polite in doing so. Um, yes, I could have probably been more aggressive, um, but that's not who I am. And I think anytime you run for office, run as the best of who you are, build trust with the people around you and go forward unafraid. And was it interesting to you to be able to travel the state? Because before, you know, as a senator, you're representing your, just your district, but as a statewide candidate, you really got to experience the entire state. Well, I, I grew up in a small town 
and Minnesota is covered with small towns. And so I sort of had this immediate connection with places all over the state who get forgotten, frankly, by people in St. Paul. But I also ran as Lieutenant Governor with Dave Thompson and the eye-opening experience of realizing Minnesota uniquely has mining resources, vast forestry. China can't produce paper because they don't have forests like Minnesota has. Um, our agriculture, I grew up on a farm, knowing what a driver that is in our economy, sort of has always drawn me out of the Twin Cities metropolitan area. My husband grew up, his family had a garbage business in the Cross Lake area. So seeing a small business in a tourist town. Um, and then of course, being in healthcare, you see the highs and lows of everyone's life. You see the differences communities need um, through the lens of someone who's been involved in healthcare. And so great privilege, huge learning experience. And I would encourage people get out, know your state much better. It's a beautiful, unique place. Both friends and adversaries have learned not to mistake your politeness, as you mentioned before, politeness for weakness when it comes to debating ideas. Much has been said and written about our current divisive political climate. Should more candidates model your behavior? I think political discourse would be much better off if we said, here's my line, here are the places I'm going to work in, I respect you as a person, and the minute you don't respect me as a person, our conversation is done. Um, I think we would actually have better candidates. We would make better progress in policy making, but also be able to stand up for the things that we believed in, in a way that that's based on trust and respect instead of clickbait journalism, which seems to be where things are, are going. Social media and the need to drive clicks is really destroying our political conversation. Early in your Senate career, you experienced giving birth and caring for a baby while continuing to do the work of an elected official. Last year, your colleague, Senator Julia Coleman, gave birth to twins, and she did it in a more public way. People knew that she was having, having children. In the decade or so since you had your baby, has the culture of the Senate changed to make it easier for moms, especially moms with young children, to do the work of lawmaking? I think there's more that can be done. There has been some improved understanding. I think there's a new generation of senators who just expect that children are a part of your life. And it would be nice to have the Senate have some younger members in it so that there was some pressure to say, you know what, we are not going to work through bedtime or we're going to have meetings after the kids were put to bed. Um, I think it brings a little more reality into the work of the Senate. Uh, electing people who have families is reflective of Minnesota, but it's also going to be important in the work that the Senate does. So has it gotten better? A little bit. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. Uh, the legislature adjourned in May with an enormous surplus in the state's coffers. Is it a disappointment to you that the legislature failed to address the nearly, or roughly, I should say, $9 billion surplus before the regular session ended? Well, and let's remember we passed a hundred billion dollar all funds budget just the year before. And we had bonds that had not been let. So a bonding bill would have been nice. I would have loved to see a tax cut that focused on Minnesotans and their budget instead of people digging in and saying, we need to spend even more money. We had billions of dollars of federal money flow through this state that hasn't been accounted for. And instead of just flooding more government with money, we could have given that money back to the taxpayers who paid it. That would have been a great outcome, but I wasn't willing to further increase government spending for the sake of a deal. What are your proudest accomplishments over this 12 years of your Senate career and what is next for you? Uh, well, I came in uh, with my CPA license, so serving with the legislative auditor, improving program integrity and accountability across health and human services and the Minnesota Department of Health is really important. Putting some tools at play, in place at Minnesota Management and Budget that will help us um, do results first sort of legislating, I think was really important. There's a reverse auction um, outcome that should be announced shortly that will save our state taxpayers, millions of dollars, save the people in New Jersey a billion dollars. And it's a technique that's been used in other places. And I'm proud 
to say it's now being used here in Minnesota because of my efforts. What's next for me? I know I want to work with smart, innovative people. I'm not afraid of a highly regulated environment, and I am enthusiastic about the future of healthcare, and so that's where I'm going to put my focus. Senator Michelle Benson, I want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank you for your time today. I am so grateful to have been invited here, honored to have served in the Senate and gotten to meet all of your viewers and um, the people in Senate media who help us look good. So thank you very much. And um, I'll be watching from the other side of the uh, election certificate. Each year, state fairgoers are asked to take an opinion poll on pressing state issues. Questions are developed from among the numerous bills proposed by lawmakers and represent pressing issues and concerns that remain unresolved. You'll find the Minnesota Senate booth and the House of Representatives booth inside the Education Building on Cosgrove Street at the State Fairgrounds. In addition to making your views known by taking the separate polls offered by the Senate and the House, you may have the opportunity to visit with one or more lawmakers frequently on hand to listen to the concerns of fairgoers. The Education Building also houses booths of some of Minnesota's nonprofit and educational institutions, offers robotics demonstrations by middle and high school students, and displays art, writing, and craft projects demonstrating the work of some of Minnesota's most talented kids. If you happen to find yourself at the Great Minnesota Get Together this summer, don't forget to stop by the Minnesota Senate booth in the Education Building to provide your perspective on this year's State Fair opinion poll. The state's highest court still meets occasionally in the magnificent chamber at the state capitol. Here's a look at some of the art and architectural features of this historic space from our series, The People's House. The Supreme Court chamber sits in the east wing of the Capitol building. Is it typical among state capitals, to your knowledge, to have a Supreme Court chamber within the Capitol complex? Yeah, I think that's a pretty common uh, edifice or part of the building is to keep all three branches of gover government together. So a lot of capitals uh, were designed for all three branches, the House, the Senate, the Judicial, and the, of course the Executive Branch. And then over time, a lot of capitals uh, moved the Supreme Courts out of, the, um, uh, out of their capitals to other buildings. And so that's, uh, we still have the, our Supreme Court chamber here, but the, our state Supreme Court did move over to the Judicial Center in the 1990s. So that you know, is a little bit of the same, but still there's a really a strong historic presence in this chamber today. What was the impetus for the move, and is this space still being used? Yeah, this, this space is still part of the uh, monthly meetings that the Supreme Court will have hearings here. So they will meet the first week in the historic chambers within the state capitol. The second week of their hearings they have or hold at the Judicial Center. So once again, that's an important part of their history and heritage to be a part of this building. And they still want to keep that uh, presence here. And it is really a, a pretty spectacular space to have a, a court hearing. And that's, uh, I think, an attribute to the, their willingness to still be a part of the, the state capitol building. Every time I'm in this chamber, I'm always curious what is behind the curtain and why did they design it with a curtain, which just makes people like me wonder what's behind it. Yeah, it's part of just filling in that space behind the columns. Uh, there's a hallway and then a, a Supreme Court consultation or meeting room, and that's where after the hearings they've heard that morning are completed, that's where the justices will gather, uh, talk about the court cases, or just have uh, one of them assigned to write their opinion. Because each justice has to weigh in, write their opinion of what they've heard that day and what their decision should be based on the legal precedent or what the law is or interpretation of the law. So that's an important gathering space for them before and after their hearings. As you sit in the chamber and look at the ceiling, there seems to be a lot of symbolic motifs in the design. Can you talk about what those mean? Yeah, there's uh, words written in Latin that says lex, which represents law. There's, once again, uh, horticulture and products of Minnesota. So once again, you're establishing the prosperity of the state. You know, it's all coming together to create uh, good laws and interpretation of the laws in this room. 
And then you also have uh, rod and bundles, which are uh, rods or wooden sticks that are bound together. And so that represents unity and strength. So it's you know, easy to break one stick, but if you had a whole bundle, it's hard to break that unity and that strength of, of government and the, the strength and power of law, which is being discussed each and every day here. The other thing that's really fascinating is the skylight. As long as I've been here, this is the first time we've actually had natural light coming through the skylight. So that was So that was a change from the renovation. Right. That was an important part of this restoration of the chamber was to open up the skylight to bring in the natural light once again. And it does make this room very much more dramatic. Uh, and it changes the whole effect of this space that we had never seen before. A large part of Cass Gilbert's vision was art and the edification that comes from viewing art. There are four murals in this Supreme Court chamber. Can you talk about the the meaning of each one of these murals. This is a really important part of understanding how the space is interpreted. Uh, it's, it's huge murals done by John Lafarge, one of the, the great artists in America at that time. So there are different people portrayed, historical figures that are kind of telling you the story of where our laws came from. So uh, right behind the justices who sit in the, the long bench, uh, that's Moses. He's about ready to receive the Ten Commandments. That represents divine and moral law. Over to, if you're the viewer, to your left would be a large painting of Confucius. He's in a blue robe. He's looking at a scroll that's been written down that has precedent or decisions already made by other judges and courts. So we've talked about Moses. We've talked about Confucius. Then we get to the painting depicting ancient Greece. Yes, and that's Socrates. And so he is portrayed talking to friends of his. It's a scene right out of Plato's Republic where they're Talking, he's talking about justice and the rights of individuals in a democracy, which is, a, of course, f first and foremost for any deliberation and, and justice or judge to you know, always think of the rights of the individual, no matter what that situation might be. And then off to the other side of the, which would be the, uh, to your right, if you're sitting in the chamber, is Count Raymond of Toulouse, France. It's a medieval setting, but he is standing between two disputing groups. So in front of him are uh, leaders from the church, Behind them are city uh, leaders. So there's a dispute that they're having to resolve instead of going to war or going, you know, having violence. He's saying, come to me, I'll mediate. I'll, I'll help settle the conflicting interests so you don't have to, you know, go to war to fight out who's going to be right or wrong. And then, of course, as you leave the chamber, it says, where law ends, tyranny begins, which is a statement then about the importance of the legal system in our state. Right, and that's, once again, it, it helps guide. You know, the state constitution is the rules for the governing of the state of Minnesota, and the laws are what help make that, that state prosper or provide the rights of the individuals. And if you don't have the law, then you can have tyrants or people take over, make their own laws. And so, once again, the Supreme Court is a part of that balance of government and what is voted upon and, you know, signed by the governor as a new law in the, you know, with the House and the Senate and the governor having that say, the court ultimately has a final say if that law is valid or not through their interpretation. And that only gets challenged through the legal system, through the courts. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. Thank you.